water. And we are going to be doing some things until we can have a wall and proper security. We're going to be guarding our border with the military. That's a big step. William Lajeunesse is in Los Angeles. So, William, the president won't move them until the wall is built. Right. But the question, Heather, is in what capacity, what would the rules of engagement be during that period? Previously, the Guard helped build infrastructure, fences and roads. They kept vehicles running. They operated radar and surveillance cameras and maintained sensors. And finally, units in the field at the border did not confront immigrants, but they called in agents to make an arrest when necessary. Until we can have a wall and proper security, we're going to be guarding our border with the military. That's a big step. We really haven't done that before, or certainly not very much before. So right now, the Border Patrol is shorthanded. They're down about 2,000 agents and losing more each month than it hires. Secondly, processing a single Central American, I'm told, takes hours. If a guardsman could handle that function, agents could stay in the field. Right now, Heather, we've got no details from the administration when or how many guardsmen could be mobilized or where they would go. Good guess, South Texas. Wow. Well, Heather. something something else that we are hearing is that Mexico is helping break up that caravan of illegal immigrants headed to the U.S.? That's true. Mexico did deport some of the 1,300 Central American immigrants. Others received visas, allowing them to stay there a short time. And now some will go home, but others say they will continue coming to the U.S. to claim asylum or cross illegally. If he wants to put troops at the border, perfect. He can put them. But to taint us, to use us to enforce his policies of fear as if these were soldiers? Look at the women. Look at all the women and children fleeing the violence. Our destination is to reach the United States, to support those who remain. Not long ago, my brother was killed. He was killed cruelly. Doing this for him and his family, that is why we are fighting to go there. So the caravan may be broken up, but agents say there is a daily flow of immigrants still entering from Mexico to the U.S. Traffic fell after the president's election, but as these figures show, almost every month since, apprehensions have increased as word has spread that catch and release continues. The president, of course, Heather, wants to end that, but given the court decisions about detention, that's going to be easier said than done. Oh. Back to you. Most things are. Uh, William Lajeunesse, live for us. Thank you. Let's get some analysis. Guy Benson, political editor for townhall.com. Guy, how you doing? Also a Fox hey, News contributor. What, what do you think about this idea? Does it, does it happen? Well, I think the president has the authority to do this, and I have read some of the reaction to it saying this is an over-response from the Trump administration, and this caravan is not a significant enough event to justify this type of action, and president shouldn't militarize the U.S. southern border. I would point out that President Bush did this in 2006. President Obama did it in 2010. So regardless of the merits and what you think of the president's action and his potential reasons behind it, it is hardly unprecedented. I think what it shows is that he, he's, he's determined to get border security. Um, you know, the, the, the wall passing the budget was just given a fraction of the money. He right. ain't given up, guy. That's the point. Oh, and that's it. So $1.6 billion in that most recent budget deal allocated to the wall. But what that really means is fixing existing fencing for the most part. And so what the president is probably telling Congress and Democrats and Republicans alike this is still a priority for me. If you aren't going to get serious and take lasting measures to secure our border, I'm going to send the military down there. I can do it. I can use the National Guard. And if you think that's a waste of resources and a waste of their time, then let's get about going through the process that I want to have happen and build the darn wall. Okay, here's Ken Paxton, Texas AG. He was with us yesterday morning. He was with Shannon last night and said this. This is a federal issue, and so if the president thinks the National Guard will help us, given the, the situation in Mexico and this caravan of people, certainly we're open to that if it provides greater security and protects our citizens. Okay, and then this tweet comes out, all right, on screen for our viewers. Our border laws are very weak, while those of Mexico and Canada are very strong. Congress must change these Obama era and other laws now. The Democrats stand in our way. They want people to pour into our country unchecked crime. We will be taking strong action today. All right, what are they going to do? Well, we might see, as we've been discussing, this deployment 
to the southern border. We heard from William Lajeunesse and his report that there is this backlog. We've lost a lot of uh, agents, Border Patrol agents, and there's a huge amount of time that is wasted, reportedly, in logging each person who is captured at the border, each illegal immigrant. And if there can be some extra boots, extra hands to go through that process logistically, maybe some of this is justified. But there's only so much that the president can do unilaterally. If he wants the wall built, it needs to be an act of Congress, and good luck with that. This Congress seems totally incapable of accomplishing anything on immigration. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're going to get much legislation done before the midterms. Yeah, right. Uh, final point on that. There was a suggestion about a week ago the president was offered, look, we'll give you the $25 billion. You take care of the dreamers. we got a handshake deal, and we're off. Now, the president's got his four pillars, right? Um, and there was only two included in that argument. Do you think he would come around to the idea, uh, this for that? I think he should. So I actually supported the four pillars plan that he laid out. I think it made sense. I thought it was relatively modest on his part. Uh, you know, and I'm sort of moderate on this issue myself. But when it came up for a vote in the Senate, it failed. And it didn't even come close to getting 50 votes. And the other plans got more than 50 votes, but fell short of the 60 votes that they needed. So it was dead in the water. Whether you think that's fair or not, that was the reality on the ground in the Senate. So what's the next step? What's the potential? Uh, agreement they could come to in a compromise, 25 billion for the wall, a more limited Dream Act for those DACA individuals. To me, that seems like a pretty fair trade-off. But again, what yeah. might seem fair and logical in this town does not necessarily get done. Got it. Okay, w work on the logic. Thank you, guy. <laughs> guy thank you, Bill. Guy Benson in D.C. Thank you. But today marks 50 years since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Here's a live look. This is happening right now at the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. That's where a day of tributes are planned. It's getting underway right now. Uh, other cities around the nation also planning events to honor Dr. King. The civil rights icon was shot and killed at the age of 39 back on April 4th, 1969. James Earl Ray was later convicted for his murder. Wow, what a moment. It changed history in our had country, Had his too. niece, uh, Alvin to King on this morning on Fox yeah. and Vince first talking about you know some of his lessons and how we could use them yeah. today. And she got a great message too and there was a ceremony just around the corner from here in New York City last night so as we all remember that 50 years later. In a moment here Mark Zuckerberg head of CEO of Facebook will take questions on Capitol Hill over your data and the privacy matter. He will testify before a house panel about a week it's coming up here. Also breaking news of the UN here in New York there's a A drop in here against the moment. Syrian people. One member of this council shielded the Assad regime from any consequences, then blocked us from renewing the joint investigative mechanism. Our consensus broke down. The world today is a far more dangerous place because of it. The Assad regime keeps dropping chlorine bombs on innocent men, women, and children. Just these past few weeks, when the regime seized Eastern Ghouta, there were credible reports of chlorine gas attacks. It's a sad fact. Just a few years ago, a single chemical weapons attack would have united us in shock and anger. It would have been enough for us to take immediate action. Now we have a regime that uses chemical weapons practically every other week. Our lack of action has consequences. When we let one regime off the hook, others take notice. The use of nerve agents in Salisbury and Kuala Lumpur proves this point and reveals a dangerous trend. We are rapidly sliding backward, crossing back into a world that we thought we left. No one wants to live in a world where chemical weapons are used. No one wants to live in fear that a colorless, shapeless gas will suddenly seep into our lungs and leave us gasping for air. If we do not act, if we do not stop and change course, this is the world we could be fast approaching. Even as the Security Council has remained deadlocked, some have stood up to demand accountability for the use of chemical weapons. 
The General Assembly overwhelmingly approved the creation of the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism on Crimes Committed in Syria, which is collecting evidence for future prosecutions. The United States also fully supports France's inter international partnership against impunity for the use of chemical weapons. Nikki Haley there. We've She's about to say we've done it before, even with all the profound differences. But first, another Republican warning. His party is at risk of losing seats to Democrats in the upcoming midterm elections after a liberal judge defeated a conservative judge in the race for Wisconsin Supreme Court seat last night. Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker tweeting this. Tonight's results show we are at risk of a hashtag blue wave in Wisconsin. The far left is driven by anger and hatred. We must counter it with optimism and organization. Let's share our positive story with voters and win in November. Well, Kaylee McEnany is a Republican National Committee spokeswoman, and she joins us now to talk a little bit about this. Thank you for joining us, first of all. Thanks, Heather. So are you concerned about a blue wave in Wisconsin as a result of this race last night? Well, look, we're always concerned. Our chairwoman, Ronna McDaniel, and the president, President Trump, have both said history is not on our side here, but as our chairwoman said, we want to defy history. Looking at Wisconsin in particular, it is not predictive of what we're going to see in the fall for a few reasons. Uh, Christian Snyder over at the journal Sentinel had a pretty sophisticated analysis of this, and he said the last three April elections, we've seen turnout of 792,000. The presidential elections, it was 3 million gubernatorial elections, two million. So we'll see three times the turnout. Mm -hmm. And I also want to quickly point out that in 2008, a conservative judge won in an April race, but President Obama carried the state by 14 points. In reverse, in 2015, but a liberal judge win, and President Trump, of course, took Wisconsin the first time a Republican took this state since 1984. Yeah. So this is not predictive, but it definitely is a cautionary tale. Right. Well, President Trump, uh, he won Wisconsin by less than 1%. Something that I found very interesting with this particular race, the amount of money from outside sources that came in. And do you think that's an indication of what's going to be happening moving forward, specifically with these um, judicial seats? Because there are 74 judicial seats in 32 states at play in 2018. So do you think that's going to become a focus with Democrats specifically? Heather, no doubt about it. What you're pointing out is exactly spot on and a very key takeaway from this race. We saw Attorney General Eric Holder, his outside Washington-based group, pour money into this race. Billionaire hedge fund manager Tom Steyer, pour money into this race. The left, the far left liberal base is motivated and you have these big time millionaires and billionaires pouring money into these local races. So we have to be aware of this as Republicans. We have to stay motivated. We have to show up in November. So Democrats need 24 uh, seats. They need to flip 24 seats in order to take over the House. Uh, eight of those GOP seats, they rated either likely Democrat leaning or leaning Democrat anyway. Uh, 22 GOP seats rated as a toss-up. So in terms of moving forward and knowing that information, what do you need to do? Well, first off, we have to look at the primaries and what's happening because it's very instructive about what's going on in the Democratic Party as a whole. You look at California, where you have 10, 11 Democrats running in these primaries. You look at Texas, where you had Bernie Sanders' group fighting against the Democratic establishments. So there's a lot of Democratic infighting that is going to complicate the path forward for Democrats. But what we need to do as a party is expose these Democrats. People like Connor Lamb, who won in Pennsylvania, talked like Donald Trump, but he will vote like Nancy Pelosi. And we cannot let Democrats... Just reported, though uh, Coates did not give further details. Critics say this would be a big win for Russia and Iran. President Putin and Iran's president are both in Turkey today to talk about their next steps in Syria. The Pentagon was also caught off guard by President Trump's announcement yesterday that he planned to send the U.S. military to the border with Mexico. The top leadership of the National Guard was caught by surprise. This morning, the Pentagon finally issued a statement, quote, 
quote, there are a number of ways the Department of Defense is already supporting the DHS border security mission. We are still in consultation with the White House about ways we can expand that support. The Navy has long been involved in a counter-narcotics mission there, seizing more than 250 tons of cocaine last year. The Army flies drones along the border, and the Army's Corps of Engineers is already helping DHS fortify existing sections of a border wall.